they have a starter where you're supposed to stand up. You know, programs. Programs. Anybody get your programs? So you know when to stand, when to sit, when to stand and sit. I was thinking about it. I should have put a star in there and then two stars. And the second star is you're supposed to stand up and say hallelujah. And then the third star, you stand up and do a jig. <laughs> it would have been kind of Pentecostal or here. So irreverent. Okay, I'm going to preach on the Godhead. This week on theism. Next week probably on atheism. An atheist in a casket's all dressed up and no place to go. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> so in Romans 1, Romans 1, try to understand the Godhead. Romans 1. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand you better. And as we understand you better, that we can walk with you better and know you better. <clears throat> and help us to uh, be faithful to your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Romans 1. People are amazingly interested in people. Uh, there's even a magazine called People Magazine about knuckleheads who are, hope you didn't buy this, hope you don't have a scripture people, <laughs> that are interested solely in celebrities that they adore. I mean, you get no benefit out of it, you just looking in somebody's window, I guess, or what they want you to see. Uh, you know, children desire acceptance and approval of their parents, and children want to know their parents. And a wise parent will nourish this desire and allow their children to be around them as much as they possibly can and work together with them. Uh, growing up on a farm, I many, remember many, many times my dad praying, Lord, thank you for allowing us to work together. And as a kid, you know, you know, kids, but looking back on it, that is truly a great upbringing that I was given to be raised on a farm to work with my dad. Of course, he's easy to work for. My brother's not, but he is. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so, but the idea is should, we should enjoy learning and thinking about God. And it's funny, you go to certain <coughs> conferences or whatever, whatever a church has like a, a pet doctrine or favorite doctrine or whatever, and you go to these places, and if you hit that favorite doctrine, if it's an amening type church, you know, and maybe even run the bases, and <coughs> then if you preach about Jesus Christ, you're just as quiet as a turkey farm on Thanksgiving Day. And I, I know that's human nature, that's the way we are. But I just want to focus on the Lord this morning. Uh, a common word for the Godhead. So if we would read Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As was written, I don't know, that faith of faith, I might be Judaism to Christianity, I'm not sure. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. <clears throat> For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. That little phrase is changed in every new Bible. Somebody is holding truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The greatest testimony of the Godhead is you. 
That's the greatest testimony of the Godhead, more so than the trees and the grass and nature. You and I individually are the greatest visible testimony of the Godhead. So in verse 20 is the creation. Now, it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Okay, so there's a common word often used to describe the Godhead, uh, and the word is Trinity. Okay, some Baptists, some folks who are trying to be so scriptural that uh, they don't like the word Trinity, they think it's Catholic. But Trinity is just a word that is trying to describe a Bible doctrine called the Godhead. That's how I view it on that. I don't have a problem with it. It's like the word rapture. Rapture is not found in the Bible. <clears throat> but it is a word describing the main harvest of the first resurrection, or is also commonly known as the translation. So I don't have a problem with using the word rapture. Purgatory is a made-up word, a man-made word that's trying to describe a tradition of the Roman church. So I got a problem with that word because this not, doesn't have any Bible basis. Now, it's interesting. The word Bible isn't found in the Bible. The word Bible is a Latin word meaning books, meaning many books. That's what it means, the books. But the word Bible is, again, a man-made word or a man, a word driven from man describing the scriptures. So I don't have a problem with that. The word Godhead, <clears throat> here we read it, the second occurrence in the Bible, and it's found three times. Three times. And so I want to try to seek by God's grace to enlighten ourselves uh, that we might understand or learn better about the Godhead. Okay, now first off, what the Godhead is not. A lot of times you can figure out something uh, that might get to the truth by figuring out what you know is wrong. That's how mechanics work. Okay, this is clearly wrong, so I'm going to fix this. And okay, now this is wrong, and I'm going to fix this. And now this is wrong. Oh, finally, I'm going to get a new car out of it, and it's, or it's finally running right. That's how doctors work. That's how computer technicians work, is it not? What's wrong with it? <clears throat> so one thing, there's three things I know the Godhead is not. Modalism is not a good doctrine of the Godhead. Modalism means uh, the persons of the Trinity represent three modes or aspects. Okay, like water, you have water in liquid, okay, solid, and then in vapor, <clears throat> okay. I don't, when you use an analogy, it's never going to bat a thousand, <clears throat> but that would, that would seem to imply that God is in three forms. Now, I don't, I don't see that. Now, Jews and other people will claim that you Christians are polytheist because you believe in God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So they say that's three gods. No, it's not three gods. Now, <clears throat> the ones around here are commonly within the Christian, what are called Christian in the Christian realm, are Jesus' oneness people. Okay, where they say Jesus oneness, say that Jesus is the Father, Jesus is the Son, Jesus is the Holy Ghost. So when Jesus is praying here, he's sending his words up there, then he gets up to heaven and he answers the words, and he sends a message, and he gets back down and receives the message. Okay, and one of these Jesus oneness down at Rensselaer Tuck, you know, I came across these, these group, uh, it's called the Apostolic Bible Church. They're different, it's a different breed than the Apostolics over in Francisville. The Apostolic Bible Church told one of our folks, if you come to our church, we'll get your hair stand on end. And I thought, what are they, a beautician or something? I don't know what they were. <clears throat> Stick your finger in a light socket, we can get your hand staring in. Okay, and so I'm sitting in the living room with this, this fella, Jesus oneness guy. And uh, Acts 2.38 guy all the way around, I mean Acts 2.38. And so I said, you believe Jesus is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, is that correct? He said, yeah. 
And so I said, well, at the baptism of Matthew 3, it says Jesus is in the water, and the Holy Ghost descended down like a dove, and somebody spoke from heaven. I said, who's that? So I was waiting for a great oh, theological help, and the great answer was, uh-uh. I said, is that your explanation? He goes, uh-uh. I said, oh, so it wasn't your explanation. Uh-uh. I said, oh, so it was your explanation. <laughs> Uh, that was the answer I got out of that. That was real helpful. I walked out the door scratching my head on that one. <clears throat> so I know what the Godhead is not. Okay, so in, in uh, if you would, Acts 17. Now this is the first occurrence, okay? Now we can start going right down our little list. And the idea about the Godhead, here we are, finite people who are stuck in time, Trying to learn about an infinite being. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, without controversy, <clears throat> okay, now instead of me turning to these places and you're trying to keep up, why well, I've given you the uh, cheat sheet here this morning. You know, it's like, what is it, ACE? You just go back to the back and find the answers. <laughs> So he said, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. So obviously, there is a mystery. But notice, God was manifest in the flesh. So in our English class, God subject was helping verb, manifest verb, in the flesh, prepositional phrase. And then there's five more phrases after that, but it's understood in the passage, God was. So the God was is understood for the rest of the phrases. So God was manifest in the flesh, and then we could read it, God was justified in the Spirit, God was seen of angels, God was preached unto the Gentiles, God was believed on in the world, God was received up into glory. That's obviously Jesus Christ. Greatest verse in the deity or the Godhood of Jesus Christ. God was manifest in the flesh. I mean, if you just limit yourselves to that. Now notice... In, in your paper, I use the NIV, so we're not King James only. <laughs> okay, so, uh, NIV, the reason why I chose the NIV, I could use any of them. There's about 200 English translations, but what I'm doing is I'm putting them side by side. So if you built a stud wall, you don't know if it's level, you put the level up to it, and you can, and level it. So I put the level, the level is this book, this King James Bible, is the level, and right beside it we got an NIV, and it's tilted this way. Now notice, he, it take, what did it take out? It took out God. Sure, you can see that it's talking about Jesus, but you can't see that Jesus is God. All of them do that. So that's why I put that in front of people. You've got to see the differences. Oh, it doesn't affect any major doctrines. The deity of Jesus Christ is a major doctrine. Okay, now in Acts 17, Acts 17 verse 28, I just wrote 29 for you, because that's where the word Godhead is found. Again, the idea, Acts 17 verse 28, it says, For as much, uh, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also your own poets have said. So Paul is actually quoting from a poet a poem, okay, which happens to match something in the Bible. So he says, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven art and man's devices. So in the first two occurrences of Godhead, it brings us back to Genesis 1, when God created Adam in his own image. Now notice what the NIV does with Acts 17.29. It removes Godhead. Pulled it out. Okay, now, so what this does, the Godhead, first, first and foremost, is associated with the creation of man, Adam in particular. So if we go back to the Old Testament and find out where Adam was created, here's what God said, Genesis 1.26, I'm just using the first part of the verse. 
And God said, let us <coughs> make man in our image after our likeness. This, he's telling us, hey, there's more to it than you're thinking. And then in chapter 2, verse 7, he did, gives more details of the creation of Adam. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and man became a living soul. So man is a living soul now. Okay, the creation of man is the greatest witness of the Godhead. In that, I am a body, soul, and spirit. Okay, I, I just give you the Romans 1.18, how they've changed it in the NIV. Plus, they remove Godhead. Two out of two, gone. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 gives us a picture of each of ourselves. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and, pray, and I pray God your whole spirit, and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So each and every one of us are a tripart being. Okay, now the soul, man's soul, okay, if you use a tire, you have the tire which is the outer side you see. Inside the tires used to be inner tubes, now they got tubeless tires, but you used to have an inner tube in the shape of the tire, in a way, and then inside of it was air, wind, that's the spirit, where he breathed into him life. <clears throat> that's, you see, energy, that life of energy that's in a seed or in a person cannot be explained. Atheists think they got us stumped. You can't explain God. You can't explain energy. You can't explain consciousness. Explain that. They can't do it. Okay, and so they always think they're really smart in thinking. They're not. Now in Psalm 42, it likens our soul to God the Father, what we know to be God the Father. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after the O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Okay, then our spirit, that's the energy in us, that's the life in us, is Job 33, 4. The spirit of God hath made me, the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. So the life is coming from the spirit of God. Okay, now, it doesn't appear that the Jews knew the Godhead as a people, but we have an advantage of hindsight. So we're reading back so we can find it all through the Old Testament. John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, quickeneth to be made alive. Okay, the flesh profit nothing, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Okay, the words, now that's what makes this book unique, in that not only is this a, a book that has words, has ink on paper, <clears throat> but this book is spiritual, and that's the problem people have with it is the spiritual aspect of this book. Okay, now, Jesus Christ parallels our body. So our soul would be the Father, the Spirit would be the Holy Ghost, Jesus would be our body. That's the visible aspect. Colossians 1.15 who, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. The Lord Jesus Christ is the very first person who was born of God. Adam was created by God. He was called the Son of God as a creation. But Jesus Christ is the first begotten of the Father. Hebrews 1.6. And here, he's the firstborn. That's very significant to get that. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him and, by, and, and he is before all things and by him all things consist. And then Colossians 2.9 is the third occurrence of Godhead. For in him <coughs> dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
So I can truly say to a person, because I'm a tripart being, that you see me, but yet you don't see me. And they say, you're crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's been, I've been accused of that before. <laughs> I'm standing here, but I'm seated in the heavens. Huh? Forget it. Okay, notice what the NIV does again. Removes Godhead. Three out of three. Strike three, you're out. Okay, so we see that the Godhead is associated to the creation of man. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Okay, we read that. That's Genesis 2, verse 7. Adam was made a living soul. Different than animals. Okay, the last Adam, the Lord Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. So we see here that the Godhead is associated with the creation of man. The second thought is this. There is a hierarchy in the Godhead. There's a hierarchy. Okay, when, when we say the Godhead or the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, that just flows. It feels weird if you say the Son, the Father, the Holy Ghost. Uh, the Holy Ghost, the Son, the Father. The Holy Ghost, the Father, the Son. Why? Matthew 28, 19 lays it out. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. That's the hierarchy. Okay, I, I, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, I forgot to get in there. So that one says, God is the head of Christ. That's the hierarchy. Jesus said in John 14, 28, at the end of the verse, he said, My Father is greater than I. There's a hierarchy. Okay, so the Son glorifies the Father, but then the Holy Ghost, when he is being introduced by Jesus Christ to the apostles, he says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth. Now, I underline that. Why? That is a promise. That is a promise directed to you, right at you and I. That is a promise you need to bank on. If you don't understand something, claim the promise. Say, God, I'm claiming that promise. You promised that the Spirit would guide me in all truth. Now, there is a, there is a condition on that by other passages. Your heart's got to be sincere, honest, and humble. Okay, that takes us to Ezekiel 14. That's probably the scariest chapter in the Bible. I intend to do that on Thursday night. So, there is a hierarchy. Now, what the Holy Ghost does, it says, For he shall not speak of himself, for whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. Okay, those four words tell you the charismatic movement is not a movement of God. It's a counterfeit movement. Why? Because their spirit glorifies the gifts. The Holy Ghost in the hierarchy glorifies the Son, the Son glorifies the Father. So there is a hierarchy. But, but, there is an equality within the Godhead. John, uh, the equality comes from Hebrews 1.8. Okay, now I've heard people often say, Jesus is not God because he never said he was God. Well, I'll agree that you with you that Jesus never said he came out directly saying he is God. I'll agree with that statement. So I'll rely upon the Father. Hebrews 1.8 says, But unto the Son he saith, Now who's talking to the Son? Thy throne, O God. Okay, so the Father says the Son is God. You see, there's a hierarchy, but there's also an equality in there. In John 5.18, this is what the Jews got upset about, is because Jesus said God with his Father, making himself equal with God. And then Philippians 2, verse 5-8, through 8, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in a form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. See, there is an equality. It's like a child under their parents' authority, when that child becomes of age in our culture, is 18, in the Bible it's 19, because in the Bible, and even in the Vietnam culture, when a child is born, they're age one at birth. 
Okay, so in the Bible it's 20, but yet you take it one at birth, so 19 in the Bible. In our culture it's 18. That child now is equal with parent. Equal as far as standing goes. Okay, then you get involved in job. That's different. That's a whole different setting. So it says, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, humbled himself to what? The hierarchy is what he did, and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. Okay, now here's explained equality again, 1 John 5, 7. Now this verse is really, really hit hard. The Johannin comma here. Yeah, I mean, they throw in all these big words, you know, and try to tell you it shouldn't be in the Bible. Okay, 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word. Now you can see the Word is an uppercase W. That's found seven times in the Bible. When you see it like that, that is dealing with the flesh and blood Word of God. Now the flesh and bones Word of God, Jesus Christ. But as on earth, flesh and blood Word of God. Where lowercase W is paper and ink Word of God. And the problem with the fellows that are always hitting this verse is it's equality, it's making Jesus and the Word equal. They, woo, they don't like that. Plus, it's showing the Godhead. So we have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in, in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. So obviously, you can see a parallel there. Spirit, Father, Water, Word, Blood, Holy Ghost. And these three agree in one. Now, I, I highlighted that. Now, get it. It says three are one. Then it says three agree in one. That gives us a strong hint of where he's heading with this. So there is an equality. Okay, where the Godhead are one. The three are one, parallels three, agree in one. Now, I had a young fellow one time, he was, you know, he was just being a smart aleck, which is fine. I don't mind smart alecks. They're entertaining. And you just got to relax and go with the flow, especially when you're around college campuses. I mean, they, just, they like to laugh. I like to laugh, too. Sometimes they're really funny. And so he said to me, well, can you give me an illustration of the Trinity? I said, yeah. What is it? I said, one times one times one is... Well, I don't... Oh, come on, I just gave you one. It's just that you didn't like it. You didn't think of that one. Okay, so that's what he was looking for. But, you know, I could have really set him up. And I said, if I give you one, will you believe it? <laughs> and then he would have... Hmm, maybe he's got one. Hmm, I don't want to commit myself on this one. Okay, so there is an equality with, with in the Godhead. Jesus said in John 10.30, I and my Father are one. That's what he said. Is he confused? Okay, now look at this, if you would, in your paper, 1 John 5, 7. Look at how this is hit by the, new, by the, uh, the great skull heirs. NIV, for there are three that testify. That's it, 1 John 5, 7. You see, they say they're easier reading, and that's why, it's because there's less words. Easier memory, that's all they have. They don't have Father, Word, Holy Ghost. They take the first part of seven and the last part of eight and put it together. Why do they do that? We follow our manuscripts. No, they don't. No, they don't. Ball face liars. Now, that one I thought was so significant, we hit the New American Standard version. Now, most of the time they say New American Standard B, Bible, because that's their preference. That's the scholarly one. That's close to the originals. That's what Moody Bible would say. Moody Bibles would say. But look what they do with 1 John 5, 7. The CEV, Christian or Contemporary English Version. Look what they do with 1 John 5, 7. The NWT. What's that? That's that friendly watchtower. That's the Jehovah Witnesses. The Jehovah Witnesses Bible agrees with all the rest. The NIV and the JW is paralleled. 
A couple of years I had a booth down at Jasper County Fair and I put a NIV and a New World Translation out front and I had a little sign. Why are they the same? <laughs> same 16 verses removed? Same things going on? And it's kind of funny to watch some of these Christians, they walk up like I'd spread anthrax on them like, mm, mm, mm. I didn't know that. <laughs> then a Dutch Reformed pastor who is... Uh, standing there, he said, whoa, what do you think of the new King James? I said, oh, that's a good counterfeit. He goes, whoa. He goes, well, that's where I preach from. I said, oh, free country. And then he asked me about Calvinism. I said, oh, I was predestinated not to be a Calvinist. And, oh, <laughs> end of conversation. <laughs> that's how that goes. But look how they handle that. Okay, now in John 14, we know this verse. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Then he tells the apostles, If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus saith to him, Have I been so long with you? And yet, thou hast not known me, Philip. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou, that, believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, and the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Or else, believe me for the very work's sake. So there is an equality within the Godhead. Okay, now, your hip turn page. Okay, this one, sorry, you're going to have to get your Bible out and read. I wasn't going to put that one on there. I mean, you've got to do something. Okay, Matthew 3. This is the great passage that I asked the Jesus oneness to expound unto me. And all I got was, uh. So, this idea, there is, there are, I should say, there are distinctions within Godhead. Okay, that there's a hierarchy, there's an equality. There are distinctions within the Godhead. Matthew 3, verse 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan, unto John to be baptized of him. And John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and cometh thou to me. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it uh, to be, be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he suffered him. We say, put up with and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. Hmm. I think they're closer than we think. The heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Okay, now, the assumption often is, People think that he's in the shape of a dove. Luke 3 says he's in a body shape. I think it's the shape of a man, the soul. Like the soul where you put a cloth over. This old time black Holy Ghost preacher want to have a dramatic thing. So he's going to get it to a great uh, crescendo of the uh, message and he's going to have a young kid up on the roof drop a dove out of the roof. And when he hit that point, he didn't get the dove. And finally the young kid put his head through. Some cat ate the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so he lost the Holy Ghost on that one. <laughs> okay, so it's not, it's the Holy, this, the Holy Ghost of God, the dove portion is the descending. I'm not going to fuss about it, but still. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Obviously there's a distinction there. Okay, all a, pers a person may not understand it, but just admit it. Don't give me a uh-uh. Okay, and so we have a distinction too. You have a body, soul, and spirit. Okay, in that, Genesis 3, th 35, 18, this helps us understand death. It came to pass as her soul was in departing. Okay, this is Rachel giving birth to Benjamin. She died in childbearing. And the Bible says her soul was in departing. It's like the departure gate at an airport. Tears of sorrow, a 
Arrival gate, tears of joy. Departure gate, here, heaven, arrival gate. So when the body leaves the soul, or when the soul leaves the body, that's death. But not just the soul, James 2.26 says, for as the body without the spirit is dead. So soul and spirit leave body. Isn't it amazing that, you know, you're killing chickens, <clears throat> you know, I was trying to kill a chicken humanely. How you do that, I don't know. So I was trying it. And you're supposed to just go in and slice the artery, not just <laughs> the head off, slice the artery. Cack it, cutting the head off is more entertaining. But you slice the artery, and I'm sitting there watching this chicken bleed out, and the eyes are going beep, 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 beep. And it took forever. I'm thinking this is not more humane than just whacking the head off. But here, here you have bones, feathers. Same, everything's the same. What happened to it? The spirit left. The energy of life left. Gone. But there it is. And so when a person is dead, we say the body. We don't say flesh. There's a difference. There's a distinction there between the body, soul, and spirit. Okay, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the express image of his person. Hebrews 1.3. Now I've heard some, oh God, is, you say God is um, three persons in complete unity. Oh, don't use the word person. Well, the Bible does. Hebrews 1.3. Okay, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, what the Jews understood, it's kind of hard to pin down, but it looks like this is what they believed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It doesn't appear that they picked up on those us and our stuff. And then Isaiah 41 is clearly the Lord is speaking. Now, it says, produce your cause, saith the Lord. See the word Lord? That is a name. That is the one name that applies to Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The Jesus one is trying to say the Father is Jesus, the Holy Ghost is Jesus. There's no verse that says that. Lord, Isaiah 42, 8, my name is the Lord. That works for all three. That is the one name, okay, in reference to the Godhead. Now, in Proverbs 30, it seems to imply, the writer seems to imply that God has a son, but the verse is a bunch of questions, so it's kind of hard to pick up on that. But it is clear that the Lord Jesus Christ, before he left, after the crucifixion, before his crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection, he introduced the Holy Ghost to the apostles. Now, they didn't pick up on a lot of things that he said, but... There we go. Now, on, on this idea of the Holy Ghost, that's where it gets into I and my Father are one. So there are distinctions within the Godhead, but there's a unity within the Godhead. I and, the, I and my Father are one. What does that word one mean? That's where Trinity comes in, and I think Trinity is a good word to describe it. Trinity, tri unity. One, uno, union, unit, unison, unique, united, universe. One. One refers to unity. In Genesis chapter 11, at the Tower of Babel, hundreds of people were there. Nimrod was the guy in charge, okay, playing the music to get everybody united. And they were going to build a tower that may reach into heaven. That's why I'm saying heaven might be closer than we think. Okay, and so building a tower may reach into heaven. Okay, and it says the people is one. What were they, a bunch of Siamese twins? Siamese millions or thousands? No, they were in unity. In Genesis 125 and 26, in that chapter, Pharaoh has two dreams. Two separate dreams where he actually got up and went back to bed. Two dreams when Joseph interpreted the two distinct dreams, he said the dreams is one. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 through 8, Paul is saying, I planted, Apollos watered, and then he came back, he that planteth and he that watereth are one. So 
Trinity is not a bad description of the word Godhead. There are distinctions, there's a unity. Okay, now here's the practicality of it. Okay, we can bring all this down to a practicality of it. Is growth in grace will help unify the goal of true worship of God in spirit and truth. That's God's goal for this. Okay, in John chapter 17, this is what I call the Lord's Prayer. I believe it's the Lord's Prayer. I don't believe it's that Jewish model prayer. Jesus is actually praying. It's an entire chapter. It's a note. Jesus Christ is, in essence, writing, has sent to you, saying, I'm praying for you. Would that not be a great encouragement? He gets all his prayers answered. In the affirmative. <laughs> So in verse 20, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Okay, I believe on him. So what is he praying? That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, that they may be perfect, be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So there's his prayer. Lord, please make them one. Please make them one. How did that get answered? Okay, how that got answered. I should have flipped, I should have put Acts 1, Acts 2, and then 1 Corinthians, because 1 Corinthians explains what happened. Well, he told the apostles at the end of Luke 24, he said, Tarry in Jerusalem until you endued with power from on high. So he says, wait around in Jerusalem. So they waited around. Uh, so 40 days, the Lord gets resurrected bodily. Acts chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. And he told these guys, wait, wait in Jerusalem. He said, in Jerusalem, Acts 1, verse 4 and 5, right before he ascended up to heaven bodily, he said, you're going to get baptized with the Holy Ghost. Okay, Acts chapter 2, they're all together at Pentecost. A Jewish feast day would happen to land on Sunday. As Pentecost always landed, because you count the seven weeks. You count Passover, go to the first uh, Sabbath, weekly Sabbath, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And the next day, the 50th, <coughs> that's Pentecost. That's the official change from the Sabbath to Sunday in Acts 2. And that's why they start doing it in Acts 20, verse 7, first day of the week. So what happened in Acts 2? The organized believers, the organized church became a living organism of oneness. Doctrinally, that's what happened to them. That's what 1 Corinthians 12 is saying. They've been put into one body, and that one body is Christ Jesus. Now, that's a doctrinal thing. How do we make that practical? God's goal for a marriage. Okay, doctrine in a marriage you become one flesh. <laughs> but some people fight with each other a lot. The goal in the one marriage is to be one-minded. Ideally, where two are working together to be one team. And in Matthew 19, he says, Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. Okay, and so then he brings it. Okay, how can we work towards this goal? If each of us draw closer to God, as, as we're drawing closer to God, we get more like-minded with God, and we find out, hey, we get more like-minded with each other. You're never going to bat a thousand, but you sure can improve it. Ephesians 4. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Okay? Forbearing one another. There's going to be times you're going to get put out, so you're going to forbear. <clears throat> and then endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace. Why? Because there's one body, one Lord, one Spirit, one hope, one faith. One baptism, one God. So in chapter 4, this is why the Lord established the church or a time where we meet together. And he gave some apostles. Okay, they're all gone. 
some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till, how long? Till we all come into unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. A mature individual recognizes what you should or should not fuss about. Okay, and so you recognize we got more agreements, we have disagreements. Let's don't worry about that stuff. Sure, we can talk things through. Verse two, uh, Philippians two, what like-minded, like-minded. And Philippians three fifteen, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. So the goal of all this oneness that God has is that we can be one. Not only doctrinally, but in accord. Okay? And as a fellow said years ago, happiness is neither within us only or without us. It is a union of ourselves with God. And that's true, so true. So then if we go to Psalm 1611, it seems to throw in that same idea. Thou wilt show me the path of life. The thou is God, somebody praying again. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. You see, God has a pleasure with himself, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, before creation. He said, hey, we're having a good time. Let's create man so we have a better time. But we got to put a free will in there so we, we have a chance of them rejecting us so that way we can have a voluntary friend. Let's allow all this deception to take place because so, that way we can kind of weed it through and find out who's sincere, honest, and humble. We can get a volunteer. And then the closest, and then when you answer according to God, God in heaven said, Whoa, I like that. I like that. And you have a pleasure with the Lord. That's the practicality of the Godhead. What a great joy. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray you, uh, we somehow can grasp a little bit more better about the Godhead, understanding you, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And that as people, if we have that final authority in the written word of God, then we're going to discover, wow, we got a lot in agreement. And that's where friends are developed. Things that we can agree upon. And seeing the Godhead, one in agreement, three in one. Godhead, found three times. Amazing. We thank you for that, for enlightening us a little bit more about yourself, so that we desire to spend time with you more. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We'll be dismissed.